All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As many of you may know, I'm currently a fourth year philosophy student in the college. And I will start off by saying that I really do like philosophy. What you do is basically get these books, which are as heavy as a brick, the size of a cinder block, the density of a neutron star, and you take these books, go into your basement, go line by line and figure out what's going on. And this is cool. I mean, what could be more life of the mind than that? You're getting abstract things and you're making, oh, no, I have one here. Okay. <laughs> what you do is you take abstract ideas and make abstract connections between them. But what I want to argue is that listening to things like this is also the life of the mind. So how will we start talking about this? Well, it's pretty mundane, right? You silent, you hit it and it makes a noise. And that's a place to start. So Amplitude starts off at zero, increases really sharply, and then tapers off. What else can we say about it? Well, try and listen really closely this time. <laughs> that wasn't part of it, but uh, <laughs> that would have been cool, but I'm not trying to fool you. No, um, there's a little bit of a, a tremolo to the sound. So although it's a really steady noise, it also has a little bit of an oscillation to it. Now, if you listen even closer than that, there's some high and low pitches, which are near the beginning of the sound, but taper off quickly compared to the other two sounds that you hear. So, one of the magic things about science is that you can quantify this kind of stuff. So, this is a spectrogram for this sound. And a spectrogram is basically just time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. The darker the smudge at any one point on this graph means that this bowl is putting out inf uh, information, energy at that particular frequency with a lot of strength. And one of the counterintuitive things about this is that you hear this, it's one noise, but there's four bands of energy. So it turns out, one of the things you learn with acoustics is that pretty much every sound you're ever gonna hear in the environment is made up of more than one tone. And although this doesn't really make that much sense, if you remember how there's those high and low notes, the highest band disappears really quickly and so does the lowest band. So that explains that quality that we heard in the sound. If you look at the second to from bottom band, you also see that it alternates from dark to light really quickly. And that explains the tremolo. So the things that we heard in this bowl actually correspond to properties of how it's resonating. And this is cool because we can just listen to a sound and start to reason about it. So I'm actually figuring stuff out about the object. So if I take this, that was dangerous, uh, and hit it, it makes a totally different sound, and rightly so, because it's a whole different object. So this is cool. It means that we have an extraordinary ability to listen to sounds and come up with information regarding it. And I mean, kind of mundane, right? I'm not saying anything new. We do this on a daily basis and it's kind of boring, right? But this starts taking interesting dimensions in the hands of artists. So this is a snippet of sound by an artist called Oval and the album is called Castell. So, when I hear that at least, I'm thinking the whole time, how would I play a guitar to make those popping noises? It sounds like a guitar, right? That, that, that noise in the background kind of sounds like an accordion. How would you build one to make exactly those notes? So, here's the kicker. That's synthetic music. That was made on a computer. And what the guy was doing was basically taking the little algorithms that control changes in amplitude and changes in the spectral information of a sound and modeling an instrument that doesn't exist. For the longest time, electronic music was focused on two things. You either make synthesizers, which sound like weird, trippy electronic music, like Moog synthesizers, or you try and approximate real instruments. So you would get closer and closer to piano, and eventually you get at a good piano. But here's something totally different is going on. You're trying to imagine an instrument, and it's only because we can make these relationships between sounds and objects that we can do that. But it gets even cooler 
when you start moving in the realm of pure abstraction. So this is another snippet of song, sound, and I want you to think of the spectrogram for it. So random, trippy noise, right? Up and down notes, not that much cohesion with it at all. But if you pop that into a spectrogram, you get something interesting. Abstract pattern. Those random notes, notes were actually moving with a finite and pretty real pattern. So this is cool. It means that we can pick up even not just relationships to objects, but complex patterns. So it gets even, so I'll give you another one of these, and this one's gonna be a lot harder. So listen really closely to this sound. Random, fuzzy noise that is noise. There's not much you can get out of that. I will play it again, but this time, listen just for the symmetry in the sound. So there's a bump in the noise that kind of goes down, there's a trough, and then comes back up, and then you have that same bump in the beginning. So just listen for that feature. <laughs> so, still pretty noisy, but a little bit of symmetry. Yo, you wanna see something really cool? This is a face! <laughs> Complex pattern in sound. Humans already demonstrate an extraordinary ability just to recognize faces in the environment. And here you're putting one in sound, which is just trippy and weird and shouldn't work. I mean, if you've ever were fans of Calvin and Hobbes, this is transmogrification going on right here. So it means that that noise that we heard actually corresponds to a pattern. So it's only when we call something noise that we think there is no pattern. When we call a noise, we're acknowledging that you're giving up on using it for any more information. But why would we want to give up on looking for that information? Well, we have this thing called speech. And speech is its own dimension and whole body of literature of just trippy stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you use sound, you're using, when you, when you communicate in speech, you're using sound as the basis for a code. So let's imagine that I was gonna give you Morse code. And instead of dots and dashes, I was gonna give you mystery novels and romance novels. And you have a big stack of these books and you're looking at the pattern and trying to come up and figure something out regarding it. But I look at these books, I don't need to read through every single one in order to figure out whether it's a romance novel or a mystery novel. I just look at the cover and that's enough information I need to get out of it. So this is, this is cool, what it means is that the sounds are only tokens or s symbols that you use in order to communicate something else behind it. So this is cool because we're making these abstract connections. I give you the word apple. It doesn't really have anything to do with an apple. If I put it in the spectrogram, it's not gonna look like an apple. I bite into one, it's not gonna, that nice iconic crunchy sound is, has nothing to do with apple or even sound like it at all. So. What does it mean? I mean, this is a weird ability, and it seems that we're the only creatures to be able to do this. And people have studied it as such. A lot of time, energy, and money has gone into researching symbolic thought. And symbolic thought is pretty much that, how we make these connections. The word apple and the fruit is, has as much of a connection as an apple to an orange. <laughs> so, this is cool because we can study humans and figure out why we're so unique. But whenever I hear that kind of excitement, like, oh, we can study this and find out why we're human. We can answer the meaning of life and all these kinds of things, like all these really important questions. I get nervous because that sounds really theological. Because look at our creation story. God makes a bunch of stuff day one through five, then falls asleep at night, comes back to the project, and then makes us. We are whole different creatures to appear on the scene. And God is so happy with what he makes that he can take the whole next day off. We are totally different from everything that came before us. But if you look at ourselves, if we look at ourselves biologically, that it's pretty easy to imagine how we share common ancestors with everything else. So that great, beautiful picture that Darwin gives us where the little monkey stands tall like a human. 
you can see the diagonal line connecting those two states. It's, have, if you've ever seen Kubrick's 2001, there's a bunch of monkeys going about, do what they do, and an obelisk comes down. <laughs> Boom! There's a foreign intervention in the system, and it's only through that change that we can get to where we are now. And when we think of ourselves symbolically, it seems like it has to work this way. When we look at encoded information, it's just so different from everything else that we have that it, it seems like there has to be a module in the brain dedicated to only doing that. So that diagonal line is, a, is really hard to think of, but what I'm gonna argue today is that there is a diagonal line. There's no qualitative distinction between concrete and abstract cognition. You can look at the same two things and they're just one example of our cognitive abilities. So how am I gonna do this? Well, think of animal cognition. There are some really cool things that animals do. Vervet monkeys have different warning calls for when something's attacking from the sky versus when something's attacking from the ground. Now, enter the prairie dog. The prairie dog are the wordsmiths of the animal kingdom. They have separate warning calls for attackers of different colors. That's pretty cool, but it's not what humans do, right? What we do is we look at the pattern behind the information. It doesn't matter that we can make the association. The, 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 what matters is that I can say the word apple and give you the image of, a, of an apple, the fruit, and I can say the word slice and I can give you the idea of a verb. And I put those two together and you have the idea of the wedge of apple. That's what's important, looking at the pattern behind the information. Enter the zebra finch. Zebra finches can learn really easily and quickly that if you give them a pattern of their song, like some snippets of song that they can press a button and get some food. They're really good at doing this. Then you train them on a pattern like A, B, A, B. Two bits of song alternating. Or you give them A, A, B, B. Train them on that and let them know that whenever they hear this, they can get food. Then you throw them a curveball. Give them C, D, C, D, or C, C, D, D, depending on what they were trained on. They can do it. They can do <laughs> recursion. They transfer the pattern regardless of how it's phrased. This is awesome. This is the trippy human things that we do when we look at information behind a pattern. That's awesome. Like all the, all the bases and the raw material that you need to do what we do, all the other animals have it. It's obvious, right? Eh, not so obvious. Let's slow down because I might be getting ahead of myself. So let's look at the argument again. Well, okay, maybe animals have their precursors for all these special things that we do. But what we do is still special because what we look at is the pattern behind the stimuli and we do it all the time. These arbitrary connections are arbitrary. But what if I tell you one of these is called Kiki and one of these called, is called Bobo? 98% of you will say that the sharp pointy thing is Kiki and the round blobby thing is Bobo. It means that our symbolic system isn't as symbolic as we would like to think. There still are relationships to these iconic one-to-one -one sources of information that we get with acoustics. But that's, you can still make the argument that, well, okay, maybe there are some valences of what came before, but what we do is special because we communicate these deep, fabulous, incredibly complex ideas through symbols. And that kind of communication would be impossible. Semantics, the making these relationships, you can't do it with acoustic information. It's just, it just can't be done. The ideas are too complicated for that. But what if I tell you that the was being, ch was chasing the It doesn't have to be literal. I can say that I went out and took a couple, but they were pretty, so I threw them away. <laughs> it means that although we have these symbolic abilities, we can integrate it really easily with all these iconic things that we're doing. These low level, simple things that we do. But hopefully after all the things that I've mentioned to you, the ability to imagine an instrument that doesn't exist, the ability to hear sounds mixed with speech and still understand what they're gonna say, eh, 
I, I had to correct myself because if I said that the dog was being chased by the cat, it wouldn't make sense. Even if it was the sounds, you could still tell that it didn't make sense. The connection isn't there. So the semantics is still, you're still processing it in terms of semantics. So overall, I think what this indicates is that, well, our cognitive abilities are always present. There's nothing that we do, there's no information that we process, there's no conceptual activation or cognitive activity which is less human than other things that we do. All of the information in the world is an equal opportunity employer for our cognitive abilities. It's impossible not to be human. So when I think about the life of the mind and I think about mathematics, like sure, yes, that system was probably invented because it's really easy and not easy, but at least efficient and not as liable to confusion as these other ways of communicating information. But you can still communicate the same ideas nonetheless. So when I think about the life of the mind, and I'm asked to reinvent it of all things, I would probably just say that the life of the mind is as much about and as it is about and thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.